It's Thursday, May 3rd, 2012. I'm Alex Jones, and this is InfoWars Nightly News. Tonight, the battle lines have been drawn. Breaking news from InfoWars.com. As leaked U.S. Army documents outline the plan for re-education camps in America. Shocking plans discovered to put political activists in prison camps and then to be pacified by PSYOP officers. It's decision time for the U.S. military. Whom will you serve? Then, the FBI's latest plot to engineer their own job security as five crackheads in Cleveland are arrested after being recruited and trained to blow up bridges. Plus, shocking video of police drugging Occupy protesters, corrupt officers and county deputies caught in the act. Alex Jones talks to Dan Fight, the producer of the video that documents Minnesota police picking up young people off the street for training programs. Multiple participants say officers gave them illicit drugs and gave them incentives to take the drugs and encouraged them to be informants. InfoWars Nightly News investigates. Plus, an update on Ron Paul's campaign surge as he moves into position to seize control of the GOP. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. And now your host, Alex Jones. Tonight's top story confirms everything that we've been documenting for years. It's been leaked, and since then we've confirmed it's even on an official Army.gov website. U.S. Army document outlines plan for re-education camps in America. Political activists would be pacified to sympathize with the government or learn their Stockholm syndrome, because the government itself is run by foreign banks. It goes on to say they would identify malcontents, trained agitators, or people that don't like being gang raped by the government, and political leaders within the facility who may try to organize resistance or create disturbances in the United States. They develop and execute indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes. Don't like the fact your kids were shipped over to Saudi Arabia? While you're in a FEMA camp, they'll teach you. And identifies political activists. Don't have that in America. Hell, ask George Washington. That's illegal. Provides loudspeaker support. I've been to urban warfare drills where they train to target the American people. Such as administrative announcements. America is a pig house that worships your loving bankers. Right out of Red Dawn. When necessary, helps the military police commander control detainee and the evil American populations. Plans and executes a PSYOP, or psychological warfare, that's what our military is for, is to wage war against us, that produces an understanding and appreciation of U.S. policies and actions. It goes on. This story has gone mega viral, as it should. FEMA camps confirmed, in triplicate, and that they're re-education camps. What's wrong with those? They have them in North Korea. Got a little news flash for the globalist. You may have drugged and dumbed down and brainwash most of the American people, but a large cohort of us are awake. And if you think you're going to take this country like it's Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany or Chicom China, you've got another thing coming. There's enough of us left who understand what's happening that you're not going to get away with this. And by the way, this stuff's blowing up in your face. You think we're scared by all this? You may have even leaked this on purpose. It doesn't scare us. It only lets us understand we're on the right side of history. Continuing with this PSYOP, and no, this story is not a joke, it's in the Minnesota papers. Nationwide, a globalist organization is funding police to go pick up youth and others and give them cocaine, heroin, PCP, LSD, marijuana, all of it. They claim it's training officers to tell when you're using drugs. The truth is they're dumping off the homeless, drug addicts, mentally ill, at any type of demonstration to have news cameras rolling to demonize people. They also get young people on drugs so they can then be informants to set up other innocents in exchange for the narcotics. So the drug-dealing government from the days of Serpico 
uh, is getting even more sophisticated. And we've got a guest, Dan Fight from Minnesota, coming up to break all of that down this evening. Speaking of provocateur actions, the FBI has been in the New York Times, you name it, caught busting groups they create. They don't just infiltrate. They go out and create them. And you know who they find in every case, whether it's Muslims or anarchists? Mentally retarded people on welfare. Uh, schizophrenics, crackheads. I mean, I could go out and hire an Austin crackhead or schizophrenic in an hour with $10,000 to say they're going to, you know, blow up uh, the Capitol. I would never do that. But the point is, this is so incredible. FBI nabs five mastermind geniuses after teaching them how to blow up a bridge in Cleveland. And it's all part of just hyping non-existent threats. Like you're told, give your rights up. Al-Qaeda is going to attack you. But Al-Qaeda is our friend now. Uh, and we need to give up all our rights because they're going to attack us. But they are attacking Libya and Syria and other countries. Shifting gears uh, out of the latest uh, FBI provocateur staged event with uh, the mentally unfit, we move right along to USA Today. So much money is being spent, billions every month, literally to launch satellites to spy on farmers and your backyard and you and your family, government using your tax money against you, that report warns of weather satellites' rapid decline. Predicting the weather is tricky enough. Now a new government-sponsored report warns that the USA's ability to track tornadoes, forecast hurricanes, and study climate change is about to diminish. <laughs> All the money's going into surveilling the people. That's just more begging for money so they can uh, shove a uh, camera down our throat while shipping narcotics into our country. Our government doesn't exist. It's Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase run. Look at this little article. Murder, suicide, or assassination? Did veteran J.T. Reddy pay the price for going constitutional? And that is an article by Patrick Henningsen, a volunteer U.S. border guard and outspoken former U.S. Marine, J.T. Reddy, was found dead Wednesday afternoon along with three adults and one small child in an apartment mass shooting, an apparent mass shooting in Gilbert, Arizona. This is one of the favorite ways uh, the different mafia groups do it. We saw a state senator in Georgia exposing child kidnapping rings, and they went and killed her and her husband said a murder-suicide. I find this very suspicious. I'd watch this guy. He didn't come off totally like a fed like Hal Turner, as most white supremacist, but he didn't come off as unstable, so he might have done it. It's just that when you know that these things have been staged in the past with all this other propaganda going on, it's very, very suspicious. Speculation of a cover-up frenzy was fueled by an early statement by Sergeant Bill Balfoss stating, we do not believe the suspect is at large. All the information is pointing to the fact that he is one of the dead at the house, thus continuing the latest trend of not waiting for a full coroner's report before publicly slandering and implicating someone. And that happened with... Breitbart, hour and a half, two hours after he's dead, hey, nothing to look at. He died an hour, a few hours before releasing documents on Obama. And then the coroner, of course, died of poisoning, but that's no big deal. Uh, continuing here, uh, moving along from uh, this individual, uh, Oklahoma City bombing grand juror, Oppie Heidelberg passes, an amazing whistleblower. Um, Threatened by the FBI with death if he didn't stop exposing the bombs in the building. Uh, Hoppy tirelessly worked uh, to expose the truth of what was happening. Uh, 1940 to 2012, I think the last interview he did, in fact, he said, was on this show with me. Well, we should re-air that in the next few weeks. And he said, yeah, I've got to go uh, fight this uh, thing I have. I don't want to call it cancer and give it power. But uh, Hoppy Heidelberg has gone on to be with the good Lord. So... Good job, Hoppy, for exposing those globalist terrorists that staged Oklahoma City. And uh, we'll be seeing you someday, my friend, along with all of your ancestors and those to come. Let's shift gears now. Officials frantic over Ron Paul supporters seizing control over G GOP. Hey, Ron Paul has seized most of the delegates. And in many states, they now admit, like Iowa and, um, of course, Maine, he really did win. Up front, he was winning, so they just said he lost to create the illusion he didn't have momentum. He gets crowds of 10, 12,000 all over the country. Mitt Romney can't even get a couple hundred, even if he pays them, just like Newt Gingrich. Officials frantic over Ron Paul supporters seizing control of GOP. Congressman fills another 4,000-seat stadium in California. So Ron Paul is going on 
setting brush fires in the minds of liberty, educating people about an alternative to right-wing fascism and left-wing communism and socialism all run by Der Rothschild. And continuing with an apple that didn't fall too far from the tree, Rand Paul launches campaign to end the TSA. Our story went viral today thanks to DrudgeReport.com. He is in uh, legislative action to abolish government involvement in security and to replace it with the airports making the decision about their own security they want to hire. And again, that will break up this big lobby that's monolithic and can be commanded by the federal government. So a step in the right direction in a big, fat way. But we're not done with the Ron Paul, Rand Paul revolution of liberty. There's more. We've already aired this week the full speech of Ron Paul talking about false flag terror. Here is some of the man on the street from that rally. We now have the official number, 6,000 plus people. And then we'll come back with the quote of the day before our guest. It's part of the jam-packed information overload that is teleprompter free. InfoWars nightly news, 15-day free subscription at prisonplanet.tv. Richard Reeves here reporting for InfoWars.com. It is April 26 of 2012. We are on the grounds of the LBJ Presidential Library at the lawn on the east on the west side of the venue. We're about to have Ron Paul speak here at 7 p.m. We already have a large crowd. We've got about 30 minutes before the event. There are probably at least over a thousand people here ready to see Ron Paul. They've really come prepared with their signs, their shirts, their buttons. And it looks like it will be an awesome speaking engagement here in Austin, Texas coming up. I see a lot of people I saw last time around. I see a lot of new people. Um, and I'm encouraged by that. I'm not going to, you know, sit here and pretend like the establishment doesn't have a few things up their sleeve when it comes to, you know, rigging the election, I'll allege. But it's still optimistic. You know, I still, it still feels good to try and to do the right thing, even if you know that everything's stacked against you. What we have to think about is rest restoration of personal responsibility and personal decision making, and that's what freedom is all about. Yeah. It's really sad that we've got the answer right here, but we just can't have it because we can't let Ron Paul be president because he's crazy. But as soon as the election's over, we'll have him on Fox and CNN every 20 minutes on every financial show to explain to us why we're in this pickle that we're in. But every time there's an election cycle around, he's crazy again. So that's one of the many things that I think about how, at least how Ron Paul's been treated in the past eight years. Our government and our Congresses are so willing to give up our liberties for our security. I have a personal belief that you never have to give up liberty for security. You can still provide security without sacrificing our Bill of Rights. Despite the fact that a lot of people say the race for the nomination for the Republican Party is over. Do you believe that? What do you think about that? I don't believe it for a second. If you look at the delegate count, and they haven't even counted California or Texas yet, it looked like Texas was going to go to Santorum, and now he's out. So Texas will most likely go to Ron Paul. And California is 80%, with their Republican Party, 80% for Ron Paul. And so he's only two states away from getting the minimum five states to be part of the nomination at the very beginning. Do you think he'll get the five states? I do, and I think for those in the know, we, we see that he's going to take it. We are at a critical point right now. If we don't vote for him, we are in trouble. It's Goldman Sachs or Goldman Sachs. Well, it's really encouraging to see all these people out here today. I'm hoping that we're going to hit like 8,000 or something. That's maybe a little unrealistic, but that's just to compete with UCLA. The next step is the media is finally responding to us. This year we had Freedom Watch on TV, and that, obviously it was just because they were making money off of it, because it definitely didn't push their agenda. And, uh, you know, I just saw Ron Paul for an hour on CNBC, knocking down Keynesian economists all day long. So. Hopefully we'll see more of that. They're going to see these numbers and they just see dollar signs. And even if they don't agree with us, that at least works. Washington is always the last ones to wake up. You know, where I go, uh, we get the large crowds. And they're very concerned, of course, about the attack on personal liberties. If, uh, if you mention just uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, most people know exactly what I'm talking about. There's no doubt that Ron Paul's backup plan, if he doesn't take the presidency, is to continue his recruiting of the, all of the young people over to his message. It's selling, and he says liberty is popular. And I mean, he knows that whether it's through the Mises Institute or going out and just touring the country, he's going to keep bringing people to the message. 
Well, and a lot of folks would say right now, as of April 26, 2012, that the presidential uh, nomination for the Republican Party is over. But I think this crowd here proves that there's still enthusiasm for Ron Paul. And it's ironic. It seems like there's very little enthusiasm for any of these so-called establishment candidates. What do you think about that? I think if your candidate was uh, Rick Perry and then maybe Rick Santorum and Herb and Cain and then finally Mitt Romney, you probably need to not participate in voting. The very people who tell us that we're the isolationists are the ones who are always looking around for another enemy to slay and put on sanctions and start another war. They're the ones who don't want to trade with Cuba. We're the ones that think that it's time to engage in the world and to talk to people and trade with people. So they will try to paint us as uncaring. But let me tell you, people who care will care about liberty. And uh, this, this will never translate into an absolute majority, but I, I am, I'm certain that our numbers are growing by leaps and bounds. These prairie fires of uh, freedom are being spread, and there's nothing but good news out there, precariously so because we don't know exactly. We may have something happen. There may be a false flag uh, incident where some, some uh, ship goes down and you be used for the excuse to accelerate the next war. And um, we have to learn to distinguish war propaganda from the truth. Dr. Paul, today's headline story on Infowars.com is about how the government is planning to secretly evacuate Chicago during the upcoming NATO summit in May. Do you have any comments about that? I haven't seen that, but uh, I don't know exactly what's behind all that. But uh, that, that kind of no, those kind of those kind of statements concern me. Could there be potentially another false flag event? I'm always worried about false flags. We got to get going, sir. sir. And now, before we go to break and come back with an amazingly informative guest dealing with governments uh, drugging the Occupy Wall Street crew in total proof with video, Jose Queros um, from um, Portugal said politicians and diapers should be changed frequently and all for the same reason. They are filled with Janet Napolitano. I added that part, a little Texas flourish there. No, he just said politicians and diapers should be changed frequently all for the same reason. Wonder what that is. They're full of Jan Napolitano. I will uh, I will see you after the break, my compadres. Stay with us. It's InfoWars Nightly News. It's up to you whether this transmission gets out to people. They're censoring us all over. I didn't even get into YouTube censorship we're seeing right now. Find out more at InfoWars.com. Stay with us. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die start purifying your water with pro pure my friends i've done a lot of research and the best gravity filter out there bar none is pro pure and it's available discounted at infowars.com its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth there's no priming required it's nsf 42 certified optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95 percent easy to set up and use does doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139.
And we are back on this very important Thursday, May 3rd, 2012 edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Now, we just covered the unprecedented released, leaked, and confirmed Army document about re-education camps, brainwashing, all of it, right out of North Korea. We just covered that. But I saw a report yesterday out of Minnesota, and I went and did some research, and so did my team, and it turns out it's in the news there. And they're reporting with a straight face that the police come and pick up the Occupy Wall Street people and take them and give them marijuana, cocaine, heroin, whatever they want. And I was uh, talking to our guest before he uh, went to this interview, and I said, why do you think they're doing it? And I told him my reason for it, but we're going to ask him, uh, as an investigative journalist, what he thinks is going on, and I'll give you my take on this. But this is not a joke. This is not satire. Uh, this really is happening. And here's the headline at Infowars.com, Police Drugging Occupy Protesters. There's no other way to put it. And uh, we've seen cases in New York and Austin, Texas, where I live, where they would release people out of the mental hospital and tell them, you'll be arrested anywhere but Occupy. Uh, in, in, or we're releasing you out of the county or city or state jail. You've got to go there. Or we'll arrest you. In Austin, they arrest the homeless for sleeping, unless it was occupied. Then they put news cameras down there and say, look, there's homeless people defecating. So it's all part of a psyop. But I'm not joking. We're going to play some video clips here that uh, this investigative journalist shot. Uh, Dan Fight is a web developer, and he's also worked as a professional uh, reporter for the Capitol uh, but now he does it uh, as a volunteer to cover real social issues, and he uh, joins us. The website is hongpong.com. We'll have that on screen for you. But this is big breaking news. Uh, in fact, he's shattering the media control, and now it's, it's coming out outside of Minnesota. The police chief there in the area says he didn't know the state police were coming in and doing this. And in Minnesota, state police, like Texas, means feds. So uh, amazing information, but he's also got some groundbreaking research uh, on the Rex 84 garden plot, cable splicer, political roundup news that integrates in with the incredible information we covered uh, previously. So that's the in-depth summary. Uh, let's go to the investigative journalist, Dan Fight to break this down and go to some of these clips. Dan, I was pinching myself watching this video, but sure enough, I could tell it was real. I mean, Academy Award actors couldn't, you know, pose as cops and, 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 and stoned, uh, you know, occupied people. But then I went and looked, it's in the Minnesota news, but they're reporting on it. Like, oh, the police are taking people to warehouses and putting them on drugs. That's no big deal. Right, and uh, basically what, what we found found um, was pretty clear evidence, uh, and we interviewed a number of participants who went through the program, in some cases multiple times. Uh, the program is called Drug Recognition Experts, and uh, it's been run by the Minnesota State Patrol. And uh, we did uh, clearly document that not only did people say that they were uh, offered uh, free drugs for participating, participating in the program, as well as incentives such as cigarettes, cash, you know, food, etc., all of which is extremely unethical, which is why this program has no institutional review board type of oversight, because it's very unethical to to encourage people to take drugs in any setting, especially with police officers and according to participants with drugs that they were given. And then, so essentially it uh, turbocharged a situation of chemical intoxication at uh, a site called PV Plaza, which is a 24 hour open um, public uh, plaza space in downtown Minneapolis. And this program has been going on for multiple years. Uh, they did use PV Plaza as a site previously, but what was particularly striking now was uh, how closely it all aligned with Occupy as well as the statements from multiple people that they were asked questions about who do you see the leaders are in Occupy? Can you tell us what you guys are doing? Can you tell us your plans to protest on, on May Day, et cetera, after intoxicating these people in, uh, in a controlled setting, according to those participants? So that's pretty serious. And uh, the DRE program, which was uh, uh, basically built up by the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which is actually a pretty dangerous organization. Uh, a friend of mine described it as uh, globalist gun grabbers, uh, classically, you know. And so the IACP has rolled this DRE program out across the country. It seems no, no, to no, no, they are. They openly yeah. say they want to use foreign troops in America, and they do not believe in the civilian ownership of firearms. This is a, 
extremely anti-freedom uh, organization. Well, IACP is uh, one of the principal organizations that advanced the whole platform of fusion centers, and now they're trying to expand a new total information awareness type of system, which is called NIEM, or National Information Exchange Model. So um, one thing perhaps that uh, people that are both part of, you know, the liberty uh, movement type people, as well as Occupy people, could work on is trying to get their municipalities to pull out of the IACP and, uh, you know, basically isolate uh, the negative influence that this organization has, which is not widely known. But I think uh, that would be one way that we could address the problem of these kind of policies being rolled out. Well, I agree. I want to get you on the wider radio show because you, I've been reading your articles. You're extremely informed. I've been nose to the grindstone for 17 years. And I even learned some stuff and went and checked and found out you were telling the truth and it was accurate. And I, I, unfortunately, it's hard for me to learn something new about all the things they're doing because I'm so immersed in it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Look, let's cut right to the chase before we play some clips. And I want you to elaborate on, on the wider image here. Minnesota, as you know, during the RNC, almost four years ago, they used an Austin uh, Fed front guy. Well, I mean, tell folks about that because so much we see is happening in Minnesota and in and around Minneapolis, St. Paul is an epicenter. And then now uh, I want to get into the motive after that of why are they doing this? Demonize, occupy, make them look like a bunch of drug mm -hmm. heads, create databases on people, interrogate folks while they're under the yes. truth serum of drugs. I mean, there's so many things going on here. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the best way to describe the overall Midwest pattern is there's something called the Midwest Green Scare, which a really good reporter, Will Potters, uh, covered in detail. Essentially, there are tons of people uh, working for different federal agencies that are supposedly looking for terrorists, but since they really don't have any terrorists, they can collect what are called, uh, in, in the FBI, statistical accomplishments for hassling people, putting them on watch lists, and that kind of thing. Um, I was recently provided with more than 600 pages of documents from two FBI investigations and uh, you can Google that if you look up uh, COINTEL Pro Gothic 2. The first story was called COINTEL Pro Gothic and that addresses the operational pattern the FBI has across the Midwest to shadow activists before the Occupy movement started. Um, and, and more broadly, yes, I, I think it's pretty clear they're interested in doing a lot of database collection and that kind of thing. And it extends beyond the government as well. Um, there has been a great deal of overt surveillance uh, by you know shady parties around the Twin Cities um, in the last couple months. And um, I think it's, you know, it's probably fairly likely that those are people like private security hired by the banks to photograph people uh, and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a high tempo thing. And um, I, I would say uh, looking up uh, a green is the new red scare uh, and checking that out, you can find a lot of information about a, a number of different levels of this type of program going on that started well before Occupy. Well, that's what I discovered more than a decade ago. They go around and just get people to talk about violence or try to imply that peaceful groups are bad to get funding to justify yes. their existence and even one of the head federal marshals air marshals went public a few years ago that ever post and said we're ordered to put innocent people on list for what they order or if a child takes a photograph yes i mean well, I, I, I mean it's almost like exaggerating foreign military threats to get spending it's 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 creating a domestic it is. threat it is. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely a, uh, a domestic version of, you know, crying wolf and problem reaction solution type operations. Um, in the last several years, I've run into at least uh, four people that turned out to be FBI operatives. And um, I set up one of the, uh, essentially the original IRC chat channel for Occupy Wall Street when it started, because I've been involved in the live video team uh, since the very first day everything got rolling. And within a couple of weeks, uh, the FBI sent their controlled hacker, Sabu, onto my channel to kind of, you know, lurk as an identity. Um, so the FBI is really all over things, and their uh, operational pattern clearly involves planting informants, um, such as uh, Brandon Darby was the one uh, who was set up in Texas uh, to uh, create a threat during the RNC, and um, this case in Cleveland, which was on the exact same operational pattern. So there's really no regulation of what the FBI does in these situations, but whenever they create anything like this, uh, they can accumulate statistical accomplishments, and we can only find out about that through freedom of information requests. And that That's right. They're not, they're not infiltrating truly dangerous or bad groups. They're getting the underwear bomber on the plane in Amsterdam so Chertoff can make money on body scanners. They're right. going out and finding mentally ill prisoners, welfare people, mentally retarded people uh, on record to then pay them sometimes for years to get them to just talk about an attack. 
and then and then viciously sending them to prison yeah. when they really need to be in a hospital. Uh, and but but uh, are, are you excited about the fact that suddenly it's all over mainstream news that the FBI creates its own terror threats and then and then stops them? I mean, this is yeah. This is a subject that I've tried to look at very carefully for many years. That happens across the political spectrum. So I'm glad that that's being publicized too. But I would add, in the case of this whole DRE program, uh, the war on drugs has really offended me for a long time. I've tried to get uh, officials at the state, local, county level to talk about the consequences of drug prohibition creating financial corruption in the banking system. Wells Fargo is a very powerful player in this city, and they're you know well known to launder billions of dollars. Of drug money. And I can't get any officials on the record to explain if we have a Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis and it conducts wire transfer payments, like who is responsible for dealing with the financial corruption in those wire transfer payments? It's the people at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, uh, which is part of the Department of Public Safety, which is involved in this whole scandal, they uh, do not deal with the Federal Reserve. They have no access to those. Yeah, systems. let's be clear. So they, they, they pull teenagers over and take them to jail for one joint. Right. Meanwhile, Bloomberg reported Wells Fargo and its subsidiary Wachovia in two years laundered $376 billion. And then you've got the state police trying to get kids and people on drugs and offering them heroin, cocaine. You can have a heart attack on that stuff. And But that's okay. And you're like, hey, th yeah. these guys deal drugs. And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. It's so obvious. Yeah. They make drugs illegal to keep the price up. But let's stop there. Let me ask you the big question before we go to video clips. Why do you think... They have a nationwide program that almost no one knows of. I mean, I know statistics show the D.A.R.E. program actually gets kid interest, you know, gets children interested in drugs, so they're there advertising it to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and most of the cops are, you know, too ignorant to even understand that, but we understand it, and our viewers understand it. Some of the public doesn't understand it, but expanding on this complex issue, point-blank range covering this, breaking it, why do you think... Not the reason the cops think, but why are the social engineers, the International Association of Chiefs of Police and all these groups, why are they trying to get people on heroin and cocaine and marijuana? I mean, simply put, uh, chemical dependency is one of the most effective means to control people. And so the, the DRE program clearly uh, seems to be intended to introduce officers to the idea of controlling people through chemical dependency, saying, I will give you a little bit of what you need uh, in order to get information from you and acclimating that to them, to that type of process. There you go. Turning yeah. the cops into drug pushers. This yeah. is how you introduce them. Yeah, but but also too, I think um, part of the reason the video has resonated is because it's a it's a condensation of everything that's disturbing and horrible about the war on drugs from the police. They didn't want to be videotaped because they know they feel guilty about it and they know that it's irresponsible. And well, that that's like through. the troops saying we got to grow opium because we're against drugs mm -hmm. and we load it on the planes, but we put you in jail when you use it. It's all just out in the open now. Yes, it, it is. And so what I, what I'm personally happy that like this appears to have been you know an egregious enough violation to catch on tape and put the case together. And, and other people in other states, I really want to encourage other people to start investigating programs in their own areas. But I'm encouraged because I was really hoping that the Occupy movement could really get at the war on drugs because before the war on terror, the war on drugs was used as one of the main you know, levers to advance the surveillance state, to uh, implement uh, the tracking systems of the military industrial complex into local communities, using uh, federal grant programs with uh, freshly printed debt dollars to send out military hardware into different cities. Um, so the war on drugs has always been used to kind of advance this agenda. And, um, and, and we saw in South America, for example, the regional alliances that they've used to keep the war on drugs rolling are finally disintegrating. So uh, can people like the Occupy movement, Liberty movement, you know, truthers, we are changed. Can people uh, expose the different corruption going on? Can we force the different layers of government to account for all the financial corruption and finally quit abusing people? It's the sense of abuse. It's the sense of treating people well, like Well, it's the oldest it's trick like in the book. It, listen, it's re-legalizing slavery. You can't just mm -hmm. grab somebody because they're black and throw them on a ship because, you know, you misinterpret the Bible and say they're the devil and deserve it. Now you just put out a substance you know is addictive, you bring it in, you keep it illegal to jack up the price, and when they use it, you throw them in your prison for 25 cents an hour, putting everybody else out of business and driving down the wages. We were just showing while you were talking video of you there talking to the police. Uh, I want to go to this first clip where they take a young man away. He comes back obviously very inebriated. But from your research, and I looked this up, they admittedly give them cocaine, heroin, LSD. We have no idea the providence of these drugs or where they got them. Is this some crap they got in the locker? Well, you know, right. Uh, 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 marijuana, all of this. I thought this is so deadly 
that we've all got to have the government, you know, basically taking our freedoms away. But what are they doing? Again, preying on Occupy Wall Street like a shuttle bus drugging everybody up. Yeah. Well, it, it, it simply put, there's a, you know, because of the abusive nature of the war on drugs type bureaucracies, there are a number of different options that police departments have had across the country since Occupy started to try to create problems for the movement. So here, uh, last fall uh, in Minneapolis, uh, they would definitely drop off people that were very intoxicated at the Occupy site. Um, and it was pretty well known in New York that the NYPD was dropping off uh, intoxicated people, telling them to concentrate essentially in the Occupy space while they were intoxicated in one way or another, or people that were known And by the way, that's not your opinion. I mean, in Austin, they admitted yeah. they were dumping upwards of 50 drunks a day, saying, we won't take you to jail, come here. They were drump, dumping the mentally ill, everybody, and then yeah. saying, look at it, they're having fights. Well, right, exactly. And so, um, right, and there, so there were fights in the last couple of weeks, and there was, there was uh, you know, an allegation of a sexual assault. And so the question is, was the person who committed that sexual assault, had they just been through that program a couple hours earlier? Because that would mean that all of these law enforcement parties are directly liable for that sexual assault. And, and I think you can see how when this program is running, it really shifts the atmosphere in the whole space. It becomes a total distortion. That's why it's, it's MK Occupy Minnesota. It's what happens when a, a government program with no oversight is rolled out. Um, and, and I think that uh, the reason that it has this nature that comes across in the video is simply because the war on drugs is so intrinsically abusive. It, tr it trains police to treat people like objects. And, not and by the way, like treatment, not talk, treat with them like human beings, you know, I agree. But the, look, I've studied and I know you have MK Ultra, MK Naomi, mind control uh, in, in the late. 50s, early 60s, the CIA throwing suitcases of LSD and uh, mm -hmm. the University right. of Texas down the road and Harvard and Theodore yeah. Kaczynski was part of that program and mind control programs and 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 government uh, releasing the the uh, recipe for crack cocaine. That's all declassified. Mm -hmm. I mean, here they are, and these cops are compartmentalized. They're just like we're doing a training program to see what drugs look like. Oh, give me a break. They're being taught to be drug pushers. This is outrageous. Well, and, and here's, if I can uh, back it up for a second, I think uh, the idea people should try to understand, regardless of their standpoint, is that we are all uh, enmeshed in a, a web of power at, at different levels and different ways and different assumptions we make and, and who we're linked to and everything. But when people uh, get flipped or taken over by the system, when they're turned into informants or peons or whatever you want to call it, um, it's happening because they're in a weak point in that web of power. And so here in the video, we can see people that are like far enough down that they that the law enforcement's being trained to get at them and then flip them over. And and you know, that's essentially, generally speaking, I think the pattern that we should all try to look for. No, you know, no, no, it's, no, it's no. I think that that's the down. answer. Look for people they can provocateur and set up, generally assess them, create files on everyone, but find out who can be informants and provocateurs because now the cops are giving you cash, money, cigarettes, and cocaine. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, it's it's been a rough ride with the Occupy movement. It's had its ups and downs, and I've been involved since the first day. But for at least one thing is that it's really flushed a lot of uh, abusive and shocking practices into the open. Like people, if we just were simply telling people about this program, they probably wouldn't believe us. But because we were able to document it, which anybody can do if they work together in a team, um, you can make it happen. I just want to add, too, that um, I did not you know, shoot most of the video. I essentially acted as kind of a coordinator, producer, interviewer. I shot some video, um, but this was a, a large project with uh, uh, people from four different organizations, Communities United Against Police Brutality, Occupy Minneapolis, uh, Twin Cities Indie Media, and uh, Rogue Media. So it was a real good collaborative project effort, but I think that if we can encourage people to do similar efforts, we can expose- Absolutely, like and regardless and of regardless of people's political persuasion, basic liberty and freedom and the Bill of Rights Constitution, due process, human rights, is the tie that binds us all together. I wanna go to this, I wanna go to this first clip. Uh, let's go to that now.
Yeah, man. I'm so high right now. Yeah, so like, tell us the story. Like, so what happened? Like, you guys, like, the last thing we saw was you gave us a thumbs up. They didn't give us a test. They didn't test us this time. They just smoked us up this time. Where did they take you? What, like, what happened? They took us to the same place in Richfield. Whoa. Right by the airport? Yeah, right near the airport, yup. And they were gonna do the test, but you know, like, because of you guys, we couldn't do the test because you, like, you guys were giving them trouble. Yeah. But they still smoked us up, though. <laughs> and then they gave me a ball, too, and we smoked on them forever. Wow. For, like, a whole hour. Was Long it straight? Was it, it was a whole bag of weed. And then we smoked it all up. <laughs> like, the entire. Like, yeah. Holy I shit. Half, he got half. <laughs> Dan Fight, uh, amazing video. Tell us what we just witnessed. Well, essentially, um, uh, an individual who uh, has been, you know, uh, around kind of the Occupy movement, the general scene, uh, he goes by Forrest. Um, he said that he went through the program uh, multiple times, at least three times, and uh, he was basically offered uh, free marijuana by the officers. And uh, the last time that he went through it, uh, uh, the officers were convinced that he was trying to basically expose the program so they wouldn't let him into the testing facility again but they did he said smoke him out for an entire hour um and then when he came back to the occupy site like he was uh in incredibly uh you know high and uh, acting you know a little crazy climbing up on signs and laughing about things and stuff and so that shows uh i mean pretty clearly uh, and and i and i do commend him for uh being willing to go forth and discuss this and be open about his identity. He went and told the city council uh, in Minneapolis yesterday uh, in person about what had happened as well. So um, it's imperative that we find people that are willing to step forward and, and show how this works. But but essentially Forrest says, he, you know, that he was intoxicated when the police gave him drugs and he was sober when he left. And when he came back, he was very, very messed up. And that's incredibly unethical, if not illegal. And we're going to play, oh, it's totally illegal. We're going to play a clip of that right now. But when we come back, I want to ask you the question. Well, I'll ask that question when we come back. Here's that clip at the city council. My name is Forrest. Uh, I'm here with Occupy. I'm not going to tell you my address, bro. I live near Potterhorn Park. Um, I'm here to speak about, because everybody's been talking about it, the police and the sheriff. They, yeah, I'm one of the persons who got taken away. They gave me a full bag of weed, and they gave me a a pipe to smoke it out of, and they just took us out to, I forgot the name of the airfield, but it's somewhere in Richfield, out near this bus line, 66 in Cedar, and they let us smoke it on those uh, sand hills where the dirt pits were, and um, I've done it three times with them, over three times with them, throughout this week and last week. And uh, basically, I asked them, like, why they're doing this. And they say it's because we're trying to test people to see if we can catch people under the influence, you know, for signs, dilated pupils, all that, and uh, smell. They gave me a urine test. But when I asked them, like, um, is this going to be on record or anything? No, they said nothing about that. And they gave me a fake name and everything. So I don't know what's up with that. And also, um, the second time I went, yeah, I asked some friends to come along. And um, the second time, there was actually, like, media and press. Uh, I think it was Sam, the shorter Sam, um, was there filming it. And Ben was there. And Dan was there. He got really angry when they took me away from the Occupy movement. And they were kind of getting into an argument and conversation with them because he, he wanted to know why the police were doing this and why, why this was going on. And, yeah, I... I thank you for that man standing up for me and all the people for Occupy about the police and how. Yeah, I'm one of the only ones, but I have a lot more friends who have done this who can speak even more about this. My issue is I drive up to checkpoints or I've had cops pull me over and say, are you on drugs? And I'm like, look, I don't use drugs. You know, I don't, I don't use oh, prescription over the counter, any of it. I may drink a beer or drink some coffee. No, you're not going to search my car, get a warrant. But my issue is next time cops pull me over, I'm going to say, hey, what have I got drugs? Take me to your compound. Give me a bunch of drugs. You know, you know, I, mean, I mean, how do they selectively take some poor teenager to jail, uh, like so many friends I had in high school, and then ruin their lives and put them in juvenile where they get raped or whatever, you know, for a nonviolent crime because drugs are so bad. But then mm -hmm. meanwhile, they're taking people and offering them whatever drug they want. I mean, this is crazy.
Yes, and and I would stress like we weren't able to collect you know direct video evidence of that happening. We have, but we have testimonials from multiple people that all line up along those lines. And it, but we it know the program's the real. I mean, they admit yeah. they have the program. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it speaks to you know the inherent corruption and dehumanizing nature of the war on drugs as a system, which has to be shut down. Is it's it's unbelievably cruel and unethical. Not to mention an enormous waste of taxpayer money. There are multiple layers to this story, apart from the fact that it works out being a huge political interference drug thing against Occupy, but also that it's uh, it, an expression of how incredibly dehumanizing the whole thing is uh, across our society. Now, we've got another clip. We showed the video earlier, but here's the audio where you confronted the sheriff. Uh, tell us when this happened. Um, yes, that was uh, on Saturday afternoon. Um, that sheriff arrived. Uh, we, you know, we kind of show him uh, getting out with the state patrol. Uh, he was from Olmstead County, which is an outstate county. And um, I was able to basically uh, get him to talk about who the director of the program was and the fact that there was no institutional review to uh, protect the interests and safety of these test subjects. Because, so he's out he of his jurisdiction from another yeah. county taking people to use drugs. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's uh, you know, it's across, uh, it's, a, a whole, uh, it's a whole program that runs across the state. So, so it's um, another way to merge county. and get rid of jurisdictions. Incredible. Here's that clip. Do you have adequate medical personnel at any of the facilities where this is being done? Everything that we do is completely validated. Okay. It's being run by the state Sounds patrol? Good. Yep. Okay, Department who's, of Public who's the Safety. officer? Okay, Department of Public Safety. Who's the officer in charge? Why do I have to tell you that? Who are because you? Because you're spending our tax dollars. Who are you? Who are you? Well, he's a citizen. Right? And, so and Jacobson from the Olmstead County. Right, I know. Yeah. Sir, and Jacobson from the Olmstead County Sheriff's mm -hmm. Department. I, I, okay. I've talked with so, Adam before. Yeah. Well, we need to know who's running this program and whether or not adequate medical you. or ethical safeguards yeah. have been put in. The, so yeah. it's the State Patrol, but you can't tell me the name of the officer running the program? The coordinator for the state. His name is Rick Munoz. He's a sergeant with the state patrol. Okay. It's called the it's it's called the DRE program. DRE. You can look it up. Drug recognition evaluator. Okay. Yep. You can look it up on the internet. It's actually a national program. Okay. There we do. Yep. And there actually are medical personnel available when this is going on. Yes. Yep. Okay. Where where do those medical personnel work? Where do they work? Yeah. Where are they with? Well, we're stationed out of Richfield, so it'd be the nearest ambulance service. Richfield. Yep. Okay. So next to the airport. Okay. West side what's, of the airport. What's the facility where this is being done at the airport? Cars. The airport. It's the Department and of Transportation. Why? Right. Okay. We just look for a garage. It's it's a bit just a big garage is all it is. Okay. It's where we can just do our, the testing simple. Before we go to this next clip of another person who leaves sober comes back out of their mind stoned on something, um, tell us about uh, any other comments you've got on the sheriff discussion. Oh, um, well, I also asked that sheriff, you know, I said, well, who is responsible for the impact of financial corruption from the war on drugs prohibition? And I said, you know, that essentially there's issues with co drug money being laundered through the banking system. And he said that that was above his pay grade and that he didn't know who to talk to about that. So I haven't been able to find anybody in the Minnesota state government who will go on the record about the issue of financial corruption. This is another example of that. The only politician who's ever given me a substantial on the record explanation of laundered drug money in the banking system is of course, Ron Paul. That's right, and he won the first few states, but they stole it from him, and now they admit they yeah. stole it, but that's the way it is. Mitt Romney, yeah. another big banker, he'll save us. Yes, but, you know, I got to hand it to the Ron Paul organizers in Minnesota. They've done a really, really good job rounding up delegates, and they're bringing Santorum people into their camp, so there's still some kind of game afoot. It's been interesting to watch, and hopefully that will Oh, help I agree. The they're issue. planning on creating a big fracas and, and, and just pointing out what a fraud it all is at the convention. And I think it's a great strategy. Even though they've cheated Paul up front, he would be the nominee. He won the first few states. But they just, they just stole it because they're narcotics trafficking banking dictatorship. I mean, yeah. what do you... I think there's a new electronic voting system company from, what is it, Spain, that's going to be in this election. So hopefully... Yeah, they're going to count most of the votes nationwide. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I also wanted to touch really quickly on um, the upcoming NATO summit, if we have time for that right yeah, now. Yeah, I want to get to that, and I want to give you the floor for about 10 minutes, because I just wanted to go through all these points. When we come back from this last clip of another young man who leaves sober, comes back out of his mind. Here's that clip. Hey. They asked me how much I had to smoke. I'm all hurry, yeah. They didn't answer anything. And then they asked me if I wanted to smoke more. It just stopped me on my tracks. Like, yes. 
And then what? And then I smoked with the cop. How did they? How did they insinu- How did they go about asking you to come with them? They were like, "Did you come with us for doing a research on people who are under the influence of marijuana?" And this was Hennepin County. This or, is, this is uh, sheriffs or cops? Sheriffs from a different county. Sheriffs from a different county brought you to the first precinct of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, and you smoked so weed inside a Hennepin County precinct. And so when they were bringing you there, did they handcuff you? Did they tell you anything? Did they give you any rights or anything? Did they take your name? Well, no, they didn't do it. take my name. They didn't ask for anything. They didn't ask for anything? No. They just wanted to see... They, what did they say they wanted to get from you? They wanted to get information. What kind of information? Like how people act on the influence of street drugs. In this case, marijuana. So they knew that you had already smoked, and yet they provided more weed for you to smoke. Oh, yeah. Was it was it high high grade weed? Dude, yeah, this is some of the best shit I've had. Like, now I now I know what happens with stuff they confiscate. Said, so, would you like to would you like to partake in this research that we're doing? It's like uh, not really, but there's a compensation for it. He so, said, yeah, we'll give you more. Uh, We'll give you more marijuana. We'll buy you a pack of cigarettes and take you out to lunch. They said, uh, we know who you are. We know that you're Panda and that you're deep into the Occupy movement. And it was like, I was like, dang, am I that infamous in the system? They even gave me a, a quarter more of uh, marijuana and if I said I would become an informant. Me being the devious bastard that I am, I said, sure. And I reneged as soon as I got out of the cop car on Nicola and Matt. They didn't really mention too much of what they wanted to know. They said that they would contact me with the time's right. Just another example of somebody leaving sober, bombed out of their mind. This just goes on all day. Uh, any other points on that? And then let's get into the NATO summit. Uh, what's happening with that, the G20, and then your research uh, into the FEMA camp situation, which is now admitted. Yes. Um, well, I would just, uh, you know, simply wrap this up by saying um, the DRE program was uh, supposed to resume today at 3 o'clock, and so we'll see if there are still personnel trying to run this program. We will see if uh, there are vehicles down at the, uh, the the Minnesota Department of Transportation facility, which is at uh, 66th and Cedar Avenue on the east side of the Minneapolis airport, sorry, west side of the airport. And um, so we'll see if they keep running this program. We had to put this video out quickly because this was really, really unsafe for everyone. And so I'm really hoping that the program has been stopped. One more point I forgot to add. In the video, he talks about they tried to get him to become an informant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, uh, he said that they basically gave him a quarter ounce of marijuana um, in exchange for promising to give them information later. And, um, and then uh, the other guy, the guy with the big hair, Forrest, um, he uh, also was started questioning and he was so intoxicated that he, he started talking. And so um, we can clearly see that this is being used to train them to, uh, you know, convert people into informants. Like if it's a training program, that's what they're training. No, people that's to. how the cops turn your kids against you. This is mm -hmm. what some of the Soviets did is give them drugs. And so now the cops are the drug pushers. I guess they've always been the drug pushers. Look at Serpico. Right, they're keeping the market alive, right? Making sure the profit margins flow to the financial industry, also known as Wall Street. That's what I try to tell people. I mean, folks, do not use Big Pharma. They make money, these illegal drugs. It's just, come on, you don't need it. You fall into their trap. But the problem is now they're making whole milk evil so they can raid us. You know, this whole war on drugs, as you said, is proliferating into every level. The surveillance society, uh, the surveillance of banking, the harassment. I mean, every once in a while I get allergies and I go to get some Sudafed and they get my license and scan mm -hmm. it and and you know, it's it, 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 it's such a joke. Yes, and and the sad thing at the public policy level, which I've covered at the state legislature for a long time, legislators who are working and expanding the war on drugs are very deceptive about the fiscal impact of those expenditures, which are obviously a really bad use of taxpayer money that we can't afford right now. The prisons now, are bankrupting us. It. The prisons yes. are bankrupting us.
Yes, but, but they lie about the fact that these programs will cost money. They lie about the fact making them open-ended will cost money. They, they basically, it, it's just disgusting, the amount of uh, essentially authoritarian patronage networks look, which you can expand and finance through this process. Look, it, look it, it brings black ops to America. It brings corruption to police. They made so much money off nine years of prohibition. As soon as the alcohol prohibition was over, they made a bunch of drugs. You could buy the drugstore illegal. And drug use went way up. You can corrupt the police, corrupt the population. You can cut it down. You can create all these rivers of black market money. It, it's amazing. Look at how the war on drugs has wrecked Latin America. And just for survival, even their corrupt elites are saying legalize it now. And, and, and I want your comment on that because you alluded to it. Uh, this drug dealing banking cartel is in crisis. The jig is up. I'm even hearing mm -hmm. when Pat Robertson says decriminalize marijuana, you know they're in trouble. Right. And, you know, the thing is that things that uh, can't go on forever don't. And so at certain points, such as with this video, we're going to finally start laying out the chunks of that that basically bring down the fact that it's a system of fakeness. It's a system of uh, fraudulent representations, which uh, let them kind of, you know, keep committing acts like, like you know, shaking people down, going to court, et cetera. And eventually that system of fakeness uh, will start failing if we just keep working at it. But it, it will take a lot of work to, to make that happen and to just prove to everybody the whole thing is one huge fake scam and that we can't keep doing it anymore. And everyone's records should be expunged. The whole thing should be deleted from everyone's criminal records. Dan, fight. You're certainly fighting tyranny. I'm impressed. Uh, you got 10 minutes. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm turning it over to you to get into the FEMA camps, your other research, other things you're working on, websites, other groups. Uh, it's good to know people out there understand what's happening. Break it down. Yes, thank you. Um, well, uh, one thing I just want to mention is that obviously the NATO summit is coming up in Chicago right now, and um, that is a national special security event. And so what that means is a whole different kind of set of circumstances coming into play. Um, I did just write a story a couple weeks ago about some a new department inside Homeland Security called Homeland Security Investigations. And these guys are getting involved in everything from national special security events to copyright enforcement to hackers to, you know, you name it. They even have like literally black helicopters landing at the Super Bowl so like you know SWAT teams can defend the 35 yard line I'm not even kidding so this agency it uh, creates backup agents for national special security events and they also have these giant uh, crazy trucks this this agency HSI is currently inside immigrations and customs enforcement I think everybody should look at it really carefully it's very interesting now the other thing too is that because in 2008 the Republican National Convention came to Minneapolis and I was really shocked to see uh, you know essentially special deployment of the Minnesota National Guard. And I wanted to know what is the bureaucratic procedure behind all of that? How is that run through their Joint Command Center and so forth? And so I've been looking very carefully for details about that. And so in, in 2010, I uh, found a file, um, a PowerPoint presentation on a US Army Corps of Engineer web server for something called National Level Exercise 2011, New Madrid Seismic Zone sort of earthquake test. And so in the presentation, they had accidentally left notes in, in the pre inside the presentation file file about a different plan, which is called U.S. Northcom Con Plan 3502. A con plan is a concept of operations plan. It's essentially a planning template. It's so when they pull a plan off the shelf and then they set it up in a place, they use a con plan to set it up. And so con plan 3502, which is called civil disturbance operations, I found uh, documentation that that is a, the uh, replacement plan for the uh, garden plot, which is the plan that the Pentagon used to deploy troops inside the United States. And so I found uh, evidence that, or citations that uh, Con Plan 3502 includes domestically operated uh, detention facilities by the military, it includes uh, riot control gear, and it includes warrantless search and seizure. So at places like the RNC, the 2009 G20 uh, in Pittsburgh, which I was also at, and then as well as this upcoming NATO summit, I think we can safely say that uh, Con Plan 3502 is an important uh, underlying uh, planning document for the deployment of troops in they the United are. They States. use these national security events as beta test, mm -hmm. not just here, but worldwide. They're duplicating. I noticed at G20 where Dew got arrested two years ago, they were snatching and grabbing people. And we learned it was private security yes. was in command of the military, the police, everything.
Well, it, it, you know, it's all heavily coordinated, uh, you know, a, a across these different categories. Like domestic military isn't supposed to be doing this. They aren't supposed to be guarding the jail, which they were, the, the National Guard was. And so um, they, at the one level, they use something called Con Plan 3501, Defense Support of Civil Authorities. And that's the plan that's activated if they use helicopters during a flood or whatever. So that's the sort of benign plan. And then that's available publicly. It's called DSCA. And I think I saw a reference sort of in a way to the story that you guys just posted about this new camp thing. So DSCA is the benign one. And then Con Plan 3502 is the new, uh, essentially the new guarded plot, the new stuff, the, the hardcore thing, the locking up. It is classified secret. And so I would, you know, obviously urge uh, anybody that has information about this to step forward because this is very important to our freedoms. And I, I think it's a very concrete example of the kind of thing that people need to look into. But if we can find those details and lay them out, um, then I think everybody's operating from a position of better information. Well, I noticed that when we posted our article today, leaked U.S. Army document outlines plan for re-education camps in America. We've got hundreds of others. There's been congressional hearings, and I had weird PSYOP folks calling him going, it's not true, Alex. Stop lying, Alex. And it was like, wow, you could hear the tactics. They are right. really scared of us learning about this. And the thing is, then they say, well, it's from the books a long time. I'm seeing a giant ratcheting up. Are you seeing that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. But again, it's like, uh, you know, before Occupy started, I was really concerned that this whole system was going to easily roll out with any real, uh, you know, layers of resistance to it. And uh, what I was encouraged by uh, is seeing that the, essentially this, you know, bankers building the police state agenda through organizations like IACP that uh, Occupy at least was something out there as a countervailing force to, you know, raise awareness of that. So I have uh, some hopes that I didn't have before that maybe we won't have this ugly outcome. And I no, think no, 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 I know, agree with you. I talked to the military and police. They're finally getting it because people pre-warned them. They understand this. But like take Occupy. People know that there's problems with Wall Street, crony capitalism, you know, insider uh, monopoly stuff. And so the, the, the media announces off of real activists, oh, there's this thing, go be part of it. Then they try to use the big crowds that are diverse to project, you know, give George Soros more of your tax money, not to help the country or pay off debts, but to give them more austerity money. Then when that didn't work, Obama starts demonizing it when he did say it was great, and they have coordinated raids by Homeland Security shutting it down in, in what was it, 30-something cities. So there you see it all in action where the system has all the money and, 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 and power at, at one level, but more and more because people are aware of it, everything they do is falling on its face. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that uh, people don't like seeing their taxpayer dollars uh, wasted for bullying people around. Everybody understands that we can't afford to spend money on this type of nonsense anymore. And we, everyone is really starting to understand and have the discussion about how financial corruption has damaged everybody's standard of living and how financial corruption has taken over control of the political system through, you know, what's called regulatory capture by Bill Black. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, step by step, we're getting this exposed. And so if people are going to, out to things like this NATO summit, I would say it's always a good idea to try to live stream video. This will be the first major summit where people uh, will be able to have really wide access to live video, hopefully, assuming they don't shut down all the cell phone towers. And we know all the information that's been coming out about cell phone uh, surveillance recently from the ACLU as well. But in nonetheless, we will get more footage than ever before of how the federal government is uh, building up police state structures and building up these large bureaucracies like HSI and running them through things like NSSEs to acclimate everybody, get everybody ready, so to get all the wheels rolling, implementing things like Con Plan 3502 and other uh, corruptions of what we thought we traditionally understood as the you know constitutional order in America, which involved not living under martial law and total tyranny. Well, I'm impressed with your analysis and understanding of this subject. Um, what do you say to people who just hear my show or read your blog? And I want you to plug all those here on Air Force. We've had them under you, but it's important people visit those because your information is very accurate. What do you say to those that just kind of halfway pay attention, who don't know that it was in newspapers that Gulf of Tonkin was staged in 64? They just thought it was a rumor until it was declassified. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same way with these camps and these plans that I see being basically taken out of deep freeze and being, you know, uh, warmed up. Um, I mean, folks need to understand this is real. What do you say to those who won't take the time out who are watching this video to go actually research it and find out we're not just saying this? Right. Well, for, obviously, for one thing, it's, it's always hard to know where to start. 
Um, and that's why it's so important that we do what, everything we can to try to document everything. If we hadn't documented this, like people wouldn't just sort of believe it out of hand. Um, and, I, and I think that that helps a lot. I think, um, you know, all that we can do is say, listen, uh, you know, as, as activist media, we come at this from our own perspectives, which may not agree with you, but listen, you guys can keep looking, you know, further into this. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, thing, uh, platforms like Infowars have done a good job of saying, listen, you know, you got to get rolling and do your own research. But a lot of times it takes a personal experience, uh, something strange happening, just being treated corruptly in a very routine way at the county level, for example. That's the kind of thing that uh, radicalizes people to the idea that the government can be very shady and corrupt and dangerous. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, we've just seen like a lot of shared experiences happen. Uh, people that had these Occupy crackdowns uh, happen, that was an experience very similar to the uh, RNC uh, and G20 type crackdowns that they've done before. So everybody got to experience uh, the extent to which the system would coordinate and try to shut them down. Also, I, I would add quickly too that uh, the IACP, I'm, I know, had published some kind of internal document about Occupy and, and uh, you know, doing, you know, essentially to encourage police officers to, you know, get this thing shut down. So the IACP in the repression of Occupy is probably a subject that needs to be plumbed a lot further. So I just say, you know, laying stuff out there, a lot of times it takes bite-sized pieces. Sometimes it takes short videos, but also sometimes I think uh, longer videos um, such as this one can uh, really lay out a complete picture of the feeling. So people don't just feel like it's a little quick. No, no, I understand. Letter. It personalizes, it illustrates the ridiculous yeah. cartoonish level of hypocrisy, but yeah. I think you hit the heart of it. What is some international private group of police chiefs doing telling our local police what to do. What is the CIA doing, and it's illegal, as everybody knows, to be setting up threat fusion centers that they're in control of? All of this is a joke. So just like we had 800 cities and five states say no to the Patriot Act, they said, oh, that's symbolic. No, it's more than that. We've had two states pass laws against the NDAA. Uh, all of this is happening. We go in and say, no, this is illegal. This is a 10th Amendment violation, as Ron mm -hmm. Paul's pointed out. You can't be doing this. Stop coming in here and taking over our police department. We live here in Minnesota. Yes. We live in Texas. We live in New York. We live in Maine. We live in Florida. Get out. I mean, people get that. Get yes. out. Yeah, absolutely. And um, fortunately, here in Minnesota, we still have the Minnesota Data Practices Act. So I'm hoping that we can, you know, get all the emails behind this program. I think that would be really helpful. So people have to keep keep making document requests every way you can. You'll find a lot of details that you didn't expect. A lot of weird little coordination groups up to different things. No, exactly. They're lazy. If about. you hit five different groups, they'll deny you in three, but be too lazy to catch the other two. Yeah, exactly. Actually, yes. Sending out data requests to obscure places that aren't expecting them is one of the best approaches to getting at uh, deeply buried stories. So that that would be uh, definitely one suggested uh, approach I would uh, recommend for everybody. You know, get that video camera out there, get those data requests out there, um, start pulling that stuff together, and then. If you can, you know, make that impactful case and put them really on the spot, like that's what you have to do to really affect uh, the flow of decision making, which happens in these uh, authoritarian bureaucracies that we're all so concerned about, you know, rightfully so. Wow. Well, I'm excited about the work you guys are doing, all the groups there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, I mean, I've seen a lot of activism out of Minnesota since four years ago. I mean, I, I saw it before, but... Since everybody saw the, the, the Fed command and demand and set up those innocent activists and sent them to prison with the uh, Moloff cocktails, I think that's really gotten people energized. I'm watching that from afar, but am I right? Right. Well, and I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, Minneapolis has really bore the brunt of a lot of FBI COINTELPRO operations, especially in the kind of anarchist and socialist scene going on. But people have learned from experience. People have learned about uh, grand jury resistance. People have learned about the operational patterns of informants. People have learned to look out for their friends and have a good sense of how people operate. And I think that um, those experiences actually contributed to a base which uh, helped make the Occupy movement um, uh, achieve more tangible traction and more tangible benefits and not simply uh, just get played by the usual bag of tricks, generally speaking. Um, and, and I think that that's uh, been effective. But I would say that a lot of us here uh, feel like we've you know, been around the block with freaky government suppression and we're, and we're not backing down anytime soon and we're going to get the word out so people actually understand. Have you found that the more you resist, the stronger you get? I mean, resistance is victory. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think once you get momentum really rolling, then you can really start making things happen. People see that. It gets new people motivated because what we're really 
I would say broadly that the Occupy uh, movement is about getting people to snap out of passivity, out of being passive spectators and getting them to do their own stuff and have agency in their own lives, but also not like, you know, take orders from cadres of establishment people from whatever form of the establishment that's out there, but getting people to have agency in their own lives and showing them that they can do that, that they can, uh, you know, take action themselves and not just sort of uh, fob off responsibility through representatives and bureaucracies and stuff like that. So I think that that's been successful. And I think that applies to everybody, regardless of exactly. Standpoint. Instead and of just begging some standard. bureaucrat, you can show where they violated the laws and things and show them yeah. who's boss. I mean, the power of activism, so many people just sit back and never get involved. But once you get involved, there's no going back to that sanitized world that's destroying our, our society. Yeah. Right, and but also to you know, it's important when we when we challenge very difficult things, and we have you know a whole line of you know turtled up riot police, and we're dealing with you know documents that talk about rounding people up and taking all their rights away and stuff. We have to remember is that it, it we also never want to be conveyors for the sense of fear, and that's why I've always tried to use humor um, as a way to kind of like uh, cut these daunting opponents down to size because it's all a farce. It's a, it's a put on. It's a show. They're big puffy guys, big like fake front and all that stuff. So I mean the issues are serious um, in all this repression, but if we use humor, we can defang. Well, I agree with you, but it, it, what you fear. said is absolutely central uh, at the base of this. I miscalculate and, 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 and think that the general public on average is, is my mindset. If somebody tells me there's a great dark threat coming, I immediately want to get motivated to fight it. But I realize that when I sit here and state how serious this is, a lot of people get scared, but they've got to understand the system has amassed all this, this blustering power because they are weak and you don't realize how strong you are until you engage it. The fear is if we do cower and give in to them, then they win. Uh, and, and that's why they're amassing bigger and bigger giant tanks. I mean, they might come up with something, you know, the size of the Empire State's building to roll down the street to scare us. But it this is was, because... they had in Oakland, uh, like a couple of days ago, that monster tank that the Oakland Police Department rolled out against Mayday. Yeah, so, but, but I mean, again, it, 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 it shows how truly weak they are, and the system better hope, all these little front minions better hope it doesn't go to something physical, because then it's not going to be people facing their, their black tank out in the street. It's going to be something entirely different. Uh, and, and again, these cops, military, they're just people that are part of the system as well. We've all been under this. We need to reach out to them now, not just sit there and talk about some physical confrontation. Right, and that's, again, that's why I said, you know, we're, we're all in the web of power somewhere, you know, and so we can start pulling on those strings to kind of get those people unraveled out of those uh, authoritarian sort of blocks and networks and say, listen, like, you need to wake up. Like, your, your kids are going to live basically in a police state controlled by the banks where we're all debt slaves unless you start working on this issue because it's really, really getting bad. And it's, you know, it hasn't been getting better anytime lately, except like through openings like the Occupy movement, through other openings, we've been raising these issues, but the, the trajectory has been really bad. So, but we can all intervene and we can, we can prod at those people in the system and start showing them different things that uh, erode their loyalty to the authoritarian trend. Well, I think we've had an amazing banter here, Dan Fight, and I hope you'll come back as a correspondent from Minnesota for us on a routine basis. Thank you so much. Uh, Two-minute closing points if you haven't um, you made some points you wanted to cover. Uh, yeah, again, I will just simply uh, call upon everybody out there that you guys can do this stuff. We don't have like some magic like toolkit. We basically use live video, you know, little cell phone videos, that kind of thing. It's like you got to get out there in the community, have a good sense of who's around, who uh, gets word of, of bad plans coming down the pike. But everybody can do this. There's a huge opportunity right now to, in particular, go after the war on drugs, which is a major wing of the total authoritarian trajectory. And I personally am really hoping that the war on drugs can be challenged to the core and then finally shut down and we can end the prison industrial complex and this abusive you know, system of statism and exploitation and dehumanization that we've documented here. Here. Uh, it's, it's repellent, and uh, people sense that, and they're reacting appropriately. But anybody can make this happen, so get out there and do it. That's my suggestion. I agree with you. It's not just a wing. The drug war is at the very heart of everything. We've got to end it. And, and people say, oh, you want people on drugs. As you know, countries that have decriminalized, drug use goes down generally by about half. It takes yeah. all the money out of it. And there's not these crack zombies running around robbing people to get money to, to go buy crack that goes to a big bank. 
And every time you ask the cops, hey, that bank's laundering the money, they laugh at you. That's about my pay grade. But I think about my children mm -hmm. who will be teenagers yeah. soon, and they're going to be out there in the middle of this, and if they're dumb enough to, you know, use drugs or something, they're going to have the cops preying on them. And again, yeah. do the cops want their kids preyed on? I mean, this and, is and, just so, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, and also, too, the other thing about it is that the war on drugs and uh, the battle to repress the Occupy movement is really a battle over public space because Occupy says all of us should have agency to make change and influence our lives, but the system wants us to be passive spectators. And so in Minneapolis, they're trying to rail through an incredibly expensive new NFL stadium, which will put us all in debt slavery to bond payments and, and that Corporate type of Corporate welfare, yeah, again. Passive. Yeah, and being a passive spectator and not being engaged in our own lives. And so what things like Occupy can do, what things like getting out there and shooting videos yourselves can do is reverse that uh, authoritarian spectacle, which is one of the main features of fascist and authoritarian yeah. political regimes. Reversing the spectacle is always a, a great idea. So get off the bench, get in the game, resistance is victory. Dan Fight, great job. Thank you so much for your amazing report. Thank you, Alex. It's, it's great to uh, talk with you about this important issues. Very exciting. Well, that was a, an amazing interview. I hope that uh, all of you out there uh, get this information out to your friends and family pronto. It's up to you to spread this video out to everyone you know. Only you can resist the globalist. Because, you know, he's talking about big banks taking over and debt slaves. They're not just people that want you to be debt slaves. They're eugenicists. They are anti-human globalists who absolutely want you dead. They use poverty as a tool of control. All right, amazing transmission. Great job to the crew. Don't forget, if you believe in this information, want to help spread, um, alternative research, become a subscriber. We got a 15 day free trial running at prisonplanet.tv. Until tomorrow, I'm Alex Jones signing off. The rest is in your court.